get it started. Take a couple minutes after the line. My name is Steve Reinhardt, uh, president of the ABS, and I'd like to uh, welcome you all uh, to the meeting this morning and to uh, ABS Amerisaf Expo. Uh, I hope you've been having a good weekend if you've been here uh, yesterday. And, uh, if not, I think you'll enjoy the show today. We, uh, we have a very nice show. It's a little smaller than usual due to the uh, bad weather in the east. A number of our participants could not get here. Uh, so uh, you may find certain seminars uh, don't exist because of that. Uh, but uh, I think uh, you'll have a fun time here anyway. Uh, we were expecting uh, the mayor of Little Rock to be here to welcome us, but we haven't seen him this morning, so uh, I don't know if he's coming or not. If he does, remain throughout the proceedings and let him come up and say a few words. I'd like to introduce uh, the uh, APS Board of Directors. So when I call your name, if you just stand for a moment so everybody can see who you are. Uh, the Board of Vice Presidents, the Chairman is Alex Hyman. Uh, talk a few 
few minutes about the young philatelic leader fellows, and then after that, he has a special presentation.
Yeah, yeah I'll, I hope some of you can come to Los Angeles. Uh, I, I hope it will be uh, a, a, a wonderful event. Um, Charlton Heston, uh, the only reason I was able to uh, become president of the American Film Institute was because Charlton Heston said okay. And we became really, really dear friends. And he's a wonderful man. And I'm thrilled that uh, Sam will uh, be sold on April 11th.
sure when you all got here. I think, unfortunately, I got snowed in uh, in New York City yesterday. I got my flights got canceled, and I, I had to fly all the way into Northwest Arkansas and then drive back. So <laughs> I, I'm sure that some of you face some of the similar challenges trying to get here. Uh, but I want to tell you how excited I am to have uh, had you here for your, your annual uh, convention. Uh, certainly, <coughs> what you do and your passion uh, for this has been uh, impressed upon me by one of your fellow colleagues, uh, Ron Robinson. I understand that some of you uh, were treated to his hospitality uh, this week. Uh, he's a, he's a, a, great, uh, uh, a great member of the society and, and uh, I always appreciate it because with his responsibilities on a national level, he would always send me the, the regularly published stamp publication that would show all the new stamps that are being issued by uh, the U.S. Postal Service. And uh, uh, it gave me a great appreciation for something that I did when I was a kid. Uh, uh, I see that we've got a gentleman who just got 50 years of recognition, and uh, he's, he's one of the ones that kept it up. I obviously did not in terms of uh, collecting. And uh, I want to say that uh, that's probably my loss in terms of the, the rich history that Never too late. <laughs> <laughs> Never too late. Never too late. Thank you. But uh, Little Rock is a town of about uh, close to 210,000 people now. Uh, uh, hopefully, you've had a chance to experience some of our, uh, our, our uh, attractions and culture. Uh, for those of you who are interested in history, the Historic Arkansas Museum and the State House are all within walking distance of, of the convention center here. Uh, actually, we have eight different museums that, that are all within walking uh, distance of the Museum of Discovery. Uh, we've got the Arts, Arts Center, uh, the Mosaic Templar, which is a, gives a uh, tribute to uh, the, the African American heritage of our state. And uh, so many different things. And of course, Central High and, uh, and the, the National Visitor Center there. So I hope that uh, in between all of your busyness that you get a chance to, to learn a little bit about the flavor of Little Rock. My job as mayor is to uh, obviously promote the city, and uh, I will tell you that um, I have been fond over the last few years of uh, saying that uh, my job is to make Little Rock the next great American city in the South. And uh, this past year, uh, in October, uh, Kiplinger's, I'm sure you all know about the Kiplinger's Research Service, um, named Little Rock as the number one most livable city in the United States. I don't know, hundred people, about a million people or less. So uh, we're proud of that, and we want you to understand and find out why. Uh, to do that, sometimes you've got to give one of your leaders an opportunity to open up every door. And so I would like to present to the president a key to the city. And <laughs>
the city itself. There are many things to do here. My wife is here with me, and she's had no problem finding things to keep her busy while I was being kept busy here. So uh, uh, she tells me that, that the city is, is a surprise for her. She didn't expect much out of Will Robert, and she found a lot. So uh, I think that is very, very good for Will Robert. At this time, what I'm going to do is uh, go through uh, briefly the uh, meeting that the Board of Directors had yesterday. We, we met from 8.30 yesterday morning until 4.30 yesterday afternoon. And uh, it was two days ago. It's a blur. It, it is all <laughs> uh, Two days ago, I'm sorry, it was on Thursday. And I'm going to just give you a very brief idea of some of the things that uh, we need to call them. First thing that we did in the morning was uh, we acted at an appeals tribunal. Uh, what, the, what this is, the uh, Board of Vice Presidents is the disciplinary arm of the society and they handle cases of uh, people filing uh, a case against a member and they handle those initially come to a decision uh, about these cases and issue that decision. And then either party in the, in the case can appeal to what we call the appeals tribunal, which is basically the board grants those three people, because I think 10 is the plus on that when you go to the uh, appeals tribunal. And we had one case, and, and although I cannot uh, tell you about the case, uh, the appeals tribunal made a decision on that, which is the final decision that will be reported back. That's it as far as the APS goes. The appeals tribunal is the final arbiter of, of uh, our disciplinary process. After that, uh, we went to an executive session, and we handled a number of things. The executive session handled uh, an issue that had come up about uh, a contribution that had been given to the society some time ago. We had to that. Uh, we decided, uh, we, we approved the uh, reports from the Bluff uh, Committee Award and from the Miller uh, Committee Award, the names of the people who get those awards this year. And they're not announced now because they're, they're announced at a specific time as we get closer to the spam show. Uh, but we did approve those names. Uh, we did begin uh, talking about the possibility as a member benefit uh, and, and a new member uh, enticement, having a members only day at Stam show uh, each year, this is the summer show, uh, where only members would be able to uh, come into the show on one day. We, we haven't decided to, to do that, but what we did was we began talking about that. And we appointed a uh, ad hoc committee, which Alex will lead come up with a proposal to the board uh, in the near future going forward with this. Then we went into the public session. The public session, session is open to all, and uh, you can also uh, dial in, telephone connection. And um, I gave my welcome. Uh, we approved all the minutes, the phone votes, and the decisions made in the executive session from uh, the last uh, at phase meeting in Milwaukee last August, right up until our executive session here. There was a number of, I think there were six different meetings, uh, most of them telephone in that time period, and uh, we approved of what had happened at those uh, telephone meetings. And then we went into the reports section. The first report was from the society attorney, and as I said, she isn't here, but she told me to tell you that we have no ongoing litigation at this time, so we will be happy to hear that, I think. Uh, and uh, we have reports from the executive director, you're going to hear from Ken Lays, but the executive director, the treasurer, uh, the dealer representative, the council of flyers, New York 2016. Oh, I, I, I didn't mention, I should have mentioned that when we came to executive session. We did get a report from uh, New York 2016 uh, relative to their financial report. They have a responsibility to the APS to keep us informed of, of their finances going ahead. Um, there were report 
course from uh, the accreditation committee, the membership committee, uh, the Postal History Symposium in Aeroflatoly 2014, the Stamp Buddies Committee, and so, some of these uh, you will hear a little about uh, later. They were just reports that were in the board. There were no action coming out of those. Then we went into old business, and here. Remember last year, we 
we ask you to help us with a $25,000 match, uh, a grant that we had to match for stamps teach. Well, not only did we get your donation for $25,000, uh, but we actually, we actually <coughs> on that match request, we actually received from you folks about $37,000. So that means 37 plus 25 that we got from the grant, uh, we're up to about $62,000 for Stamps Teach out of that initiative last year. And that was excellent. We spoke about the uh, winter show in 2016. 2016 is a special year. Uh, 2016 is the year of our next big international show in New York in 2016 in late May, early June. Uh, so it's a, little, it's a little question about whether we should even have a winter show that year. And uh, we had an offer from Southeast Snap Show in Atlanta to join with them uh, in putting on a winter show that year. It would be in January. We were a little, we had some questions about Atlanta in January. So <laughs> But uh, we decided to, to take a chance, and we agreed to uh, partner with Southeast Stamp Show in 2016, January 2016, for our winter show. But then going forward, that's a special year, as I said, going forward, beginning in 2017, uh, we decided to try to avoid the winter months of January and February as much as possible. And we, we directed our shows department to come up with uh, uh, proposals for the winter show that was beginning in 2017 that would fall in the months of March and April instead. And hopefully we'll avoid some of the problems that we had getting people to this show. No problem with the show, obviously, the weather's beautiful, but people on the East Coast, uh, many of them couldn't get here because their flights were being canceled. Um, you know, there's going to be another international. Show, 10 years after the one in New York, it's in 2026, and we have to begin, it's, the ABS has the uh, responsibility of selecting the venue for that show, and even though we don't run the show, it's run by an independent organization, uh, we, we do have a connection, we are the federation in the United States that, that has control of where the show is going to be. And we, we're going to start the process of deciding where that show will be in 2026. We're going to start it in, in Hartford at this year's summer show, where we will we'll be offering groups who are considering uh, applying to have the next FIP show in their location after the New York show, I'm talking about 10 years after that. Uh, we're going to <coughs> offer uh, seminars for them so that they can know what's involved, how to, how to uh, affect uh, applying uh, to APS uh, to have the show in their venue, uh, and so that everybody who has an interest is fully, uh, is, is given all of the information, fully informed about how to go about it and what's involved. And that will happen in Hartford, and uh, the uh, applications to the APS will come to do at some point between the Hartford show and our winter show next year in Riverside, uh, and uh, the final presentations to the board uh, will take place, uh, by these groups, will take place in, in Riverside uh, next, uh, next year, the winter show at Riverside, and then the selection will be made by the board either at or shortly thereafter at Riverside. That's the process that will be used there. Um, we talked about uh, Tiffany donors at, uh, of the campaign for Flatley. Uh, there was a recommendation uh, that we approved that included uh, that in the future, we call the Tiffany donor only cash contribution to be considered uh, at time, uh, in time contribution would not be considered. And, uh, that uh, to become a Tiffany donor, you would, as it is now basically, you would need to give $1,000 cash over a, a four-year period. And 
once you've done that, you would be a Tiffany donor for the rest of your life. Uh, and uh, so it would take a thousand dollars off of your period, you could become a Tiffany donor. Um, we also decided that we would have a tiered subgroups of uh, Tiffany donors, whereby as time went on, as you gave more money, you could move up a level in the tier of donors. And there would be names for each of those uh, groups as you uh, went up to that level. And uh, I think uh, that's basically what that was. There may have been some other little things, but that's basically what that was about. We did move on to a nepotism policy. We don't now have a nepotism policy either for staff or for uh, board members relative to the, to the way we have a relative working for us. Type of thing. And uh, we came up, we had, we had a proposal from a lawyer uh, about uh, an activism policy that we, we could have many not for profits do have such things. There were some questions about the scope of that policy, uh, just who would be included, you know, husband, wife, cousins, whatever, who, who would be included in that pol policy. And uh, we uh, tabled that and turned it back. Another proposal that met some of the concerns of the board members. You begin to see why it's all ready to through this. Online chapters and affiliates. Uh, we, we agreed that online organizations uh, could become a chapter or an affiliate, but not both. Uh, we also agreed that affiliates who pay no dues, chapters pay the same dues as you do, $45 a year, uh, but the affiliates who pay no dues uh, will no longer get the printed uh, American flag list. Uh, you know, this is available online. They will no longer get a printed copy. That's where the biggest part of the dues money goes. And, uh, or any other mailings uh, that cost us postage.
price, so there will be a benefit to being a member and we're hoping that by having a two-tier of prices for the item, members and non-members will attract people who are not members and will become members to benefit from the, the two-tier schedule of the prices for the material on, on the website. Um, we're going to offer shipping discounts to members uh, purchasing a large number of items. And we're going to have a tiered commission system where um, the, the, the more the item sells for, the, the smaller the commission, percentage commission, that we'll get. And right now, everybody pays basically the same thing. And by tiering, we're hoping the whole idea is to attract better material, to, to attract the material and to sell for several hundred dollars where now the bulk of the material uh, sells for just a few dollars. And uh, we're hoping that uh, having uh, the tiered commission system that will attract more people. Uh, we approved, uh, I think this is the last one, we approved approximately $22,000 uh, to, to, uh, for architect and filing fees for the next phase of the library. We're doing the, library, the new library in phases as we get money, rather than going out right now at least borrowing uh, more money. And uh, we're getting to the point where uh, we're hoping to be able to go into the next phase this year sometime. So we did contract. Uh, we did authorize spending money for the initial uh, architectural drawings and things, and uh, the filing fees with the various governments, and whatever is necessary. That came to us. So you can see we uh, had a busy day, and we really got a lot done. And I want to thank the board for putting up with it, sitting there for the hours. It was a little painful there for a while, and, uh, and, uh, but you know we're all members of the board because we wanted to be, we wanted to serve uh, the society and serve you all, and uh, we have an excellent board with no complaints actually. So thank you all, and uh, that's the substance of. Okay, uh, brief report uh, from Alex. These two reports are going to seem quite at odds with each other because mine is very short. Due to the nature of most uh, deliberations in the Board of Vice Presidents' meetings, these are to educate over issues, complaints brought by the society against a member or between members of the society. Uh, since we took office a little over six months ago, we have uh, presided over 10 different cases. Of those 10 cases, the uh, Board of Vice President has, uh, at this time, six of them uh, decisions have been made but have not been uh, notified to the, to the parties yet. Of uh, four that have been decided and are our public, uh, we expel three members uh, for uh, not taking the bill to the dentist. And uh, we have uh, dismissed a, an additional case. Uh, so that is the, the substance of my report. As usual, I have an extensive report to make. I've taken the minutes of the society, I hope as accurately as possible, and pres uh, presented them to the membership as promptly as possible. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Finance Committee meets regularly by telephone. We discuss our uh, investments and their returns with the investment advisor. We have done that. She was on the phone with us yesterday, or Thursday. <laughs> uh, haven't expected to be here, but haven't had travel problems because of the weather. So, that's the treasurer's report. Doing fine. Okay, but we can always do more.
um, library. Uh, they continue to build on their digital collection. Uh, more than 150 records in the online catalog include links to full text. Uh, we're adding exhibits. Anybody who wants to have an exhibit on our site would be would be glad to have a digitized copy. You know, we have links to things such as Google Books, other society websites as well. Um, so we're, we're certainly working on, on adding digital content that's been helped with a $50,000 grant from the David T. Beals Charitable Trust, um, which has allowed us to recently purchase a microfilm scanner. Uh, we're using some of that to convert old society records from microfilm to digital format, uh, old membership applications and so forth. There are issues of blend stamp dues, like in the late 40s, which you can't pick up without turning into dust, basically. Um, but we have them on microfilm, and uh, we'll be working on getting them into a, a digital format. So those are certainly helping. Two major donations of archives were received during 2013. Uh, the biggest by far was the Tom Alexander collection. I think it was something like 334 basically copy paper or file boxes. Um, we've hired two interns who are just finishing up, should be finished by the end of this month, on basically inventorying everything, sorting the material, and we'll have a basic finding guide, and then people can actually start using those. We've already had some inquiries that people want to use those materials. Once that's done, one of the interns is sticking on for the Wallace Cleveland Archive, which is large, but not on the same scale. Uh, but those are two additional archives, in addition to other archives like the American First Aid Cover Society, which are are great references. I'm going to skip a few things, or maybe a lot of things. Education, a major focus has been the Stamps Teach program. Uh, as Alex uh, very nicely pointed out at the board meeting, we sort of have three phases for education, for, for youth right now. Um, the Stamps Teach is, is sort of a, a first phase, just getting kids introduced to Stamps, not even telling them specifically about stamp collecting, but providing lesson plans, activities for teachers to use in the classroom to teach your standard subjects, your math, your history, your geography, your science, all of those. Then a second step, anybody, any kid who goes through the, the Stamps Teach program at school is offered a one-year free membership to the Young Stamp Collectors of America. That has an online publication. It, it, it's, it's the area where perhaps we need the most work at this point in time, but it provides the next step, hopefully. And then for those who really become dedicated collectors and really we want to train to become the future leaders of the hobby, we have the Young Philatelic Leadership Fellowships. So we think we have a pretty good program to take them from introducing them, kids to the to stamps, to all the way through uh, making them pretty uh, strong experts that can compete with many of us. Uh, so that's been a major thing for education this year, uh, changing, moving from a pilot to a permanent, we're trying to expand, hopefully by the end of the year, to a thousand teachers using these materials in classrooms. And figure at least 25 students on average per, per teacher. To do that, we've applied for several grants uh, to, to help build that up. Another thing, the education, programs we've offered, we traditionally offered the summer seminar, we've offered on the road courses, typically before stamp shows. Um, we've, we're moving into more over the internet with a more interactive format using go-to meetings. Um, there's a couple courses being offered by Tony Babakiewicz, I think in early March, um, for example, on uh, doing research on postal history documents and rates and so forth. Um, some of these are short, it's just one four-hour session, perhaps. But again, give people opportunities for education in person in Belfon or in person someplace else around the country, but also over the internet. Uh, expertizing, I'm happy to uh, tell you that the last seven months of 2013, there was an improvement in the number of submissions every month over the previous year in 2012. Uh, overall, for the year, we had about 13%, over 13% more submissions. Um, and we, we continue to keep the turnaround time is a little bit under 40 days. Um, with, we, we offer expertising for everything, so we can't do it all in-house. We have close to 150 experts around the country, and to, to be able to turn around the average time in about 40 days, I think, is pretty good. Uh, 
search and sales, we were just shy of reaching a million and a half dollars in sales in 2013. That was down a little bit from 2012, but was up over 2011. Um, the clearing circuits continue to be very popular. A uh, way for people who had books in circuit sales for 18 months, still have remnants, getting rid of the remainder. A couple hundred thousand dollars of that million and a half, or almost a couple hundred thousand was in the clearing circuits. Um, IT website has over a thousand pages. Uh, that doesn't include all the links to documents and so forth on the website. We've also, uh, at Stamp Show last year in Milwaukee, at this Stamp Show, we've introduced mobile apps. We're looking at a mobile app for the Stamp Store as well. I would hope to have one sometime during this year. We've begun offering chapters to design and host basic websites for chapters. There is a fee for that. The first two that have Requested are up. We have a third request. I would expect that one will probably be done in the next week or two. Um, it's again, we're trying to do it on a, a service or a chapter or an affiliate, which hopefully helps them promote the hobby as well and get out because some of our chapters don't have anybody who feels they have the expertise to even do a basic website. Um, I think that's pretty much. Uh, there are other things, shows, and so forth, but I want to keep, I don't want to take any more of your time. I think the, the show is open. I think we're going to shortly go into an open session, but uh, I want to, of course, the whole thing, again, is available for anybody to read on the website. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you, Ken. Uh, Michael Bloom uh, has a few things he wants to tell you about Stan. Uh, Stand Money program was designed to provide a welcoming face to uh, new newsstand collectors and non-collectors into our hobby. And there's two phases. One has to do with the, uh, the meetings themselves, the exhibitions like the Mary Stand and the Stamp Show. Uh, at uh, Stamp Show in Milwaukee, we had the first Stamp Money booth, and it was a success. I'm happy to say that a large percentage of new APS members came through that particular booth. We provide tours around the show, advice, direction, and a friendly face, and some candy. Uh, these shows are being expanded. Uh, the next step for us will be WSP shows, of which there are about 30 around the U.S. Uh, they will have the opportunity to participate and have stamp money booths with APS providing a kit for a turnkey booth. We've received interest from ASDA to have a stamp buddy type presence at their shows as well, so that's going well. The other half of the program has to do with mentoring on a one-to-one, -one personal, face-to-face -face basis. We now have uh, seven clubs scattered throughout the U.S. who are pilots for this program, of setting up Stamp Buddy mentors and Stamp Buddies to work together, again, face-to-face -face if possible, if not by video, phone, or what have you. Uh, the early learning from that program is that the clubs themselves are really not that good at bringing in new members and non-collectors. So the thrust of the program now is to teach clubs how to reach out to non-collecting groups. For example, senior centers, museums, state fairs, and so on. And you'll see a workshop on Sunday at 11.30 on how to revitalize your club using these outreach methods. Thank you. First, Larry Lyons has asked for a few minutes uh, to come up and talk to us. Um, after that, I think we're going to adjourn the formal part of the meeting and then immediately open the town hall part of the meeting where you will have the opportunity to ask questions and uh, make suggestions or, or whatever. And we'll carry that out uh, for a while. Larry? Thank you, Steve. For those who don't know me, I'm Larry Lyons, and I'm a 27-year member of the uh, APS. Um, I've given this, uh, I've asked for a couple of minutes to address you uh, with a new initiative, a new idea that I've given a lot of thought to. And I wanted to present it and see if I can get some interest in this. And the question, this is a question period, the question is, can the APS 
uh, take on this initiative and follow it through. These are hard times and we do need new initiatives. My suggestion is to add a virtual addenda to stamp shows. Offer uh, a certain number of shows for a certain price, offer the entire gamut of all the shows around the nation for a fixed price, um, and I'll be the first one, the first customer to register to do that. And what this will do is you will take every, you will ask every exhibitor to provide uh, scans of their exhibits so that um, anyone who comes on site can, for that show, can view every exhibit at that show. You can also add all these exhibits um, on your own site afterwards. Uh, you're going to have to help, the APS would have to help uh, any exhibitor that cannot scan their exhibits. I would say we should set up uh, virtual sales booths, of which I will take a booth, um, to sell stamps um, uh, virtually rather than face to face. Um, it can be sorted by subject as well as by uh, dealer sell it. Uh, so what you can do is you, instead of walking through 50 or 100 booths and saying, do you have such and such, you can see it all at once right there on the site for that show. Um, the APS should take a percentage of all the sales, perhaps handle everything through a credit card um, and receive the percentage, uh, like antique shows, receive a percentage for putting on a show. Um, you can visit your favorite dealer on site, or you can visit him in person. If you can't make it to the site because of the bad weather in New York, you could have had perhaps 10,000 people visit uh, this show. They could make maybe 100,000, maybe more. Um, all supplies should be, should be sold. Uh, supply organizations. Uh, it, it astounded me that you can't go down on the floor right now and buy a stamped album or hinges. You should be able to do that at every show. And the only way to provide that is have it virtual um, so that it can be mailed to you. Uh, every exhibit, I said, um, for judging. Obviously, every exhibit must come to the show for judging because uh, you can't present an exhibit uh, virtually to be judged. Um, I think we should also have a live webinar for the uh, award ceremony. This way, anyone who couldn't uh, make it, uh, it costs thousands of dollars to come to a show, uh, depending on your airplane connections and, and hotel. Um, you, you could have hundreds of thousands more people. The amount of hits that you could get on this could be absolutely enormous. So, uh, you questioned with the shows in, in Atlanta, perfect place, uh, virtual show. Um, so my question to the APS is, think out of the box, is this a good idea, and if so, can you implement it um, for at least some shows, if not every show in the United States. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Larry, is, uh, you put this in the form of a, a written proposal, and then I'll, I'll, uh, I'll connect you with our technology division, and uh, you can begin by working with them. And uh, if they see value in this, they will then come to the, the board with it. We have a committee system uh, in the ABS, and, and we try to work as much through the committees as possible. Okay, we're, we're going to adjourn the formal part of the meeting, and we usually adjourn the meeting. Uh, Ken, why don't you come up and, and you, you know the, the older members better than I do. Oh, well, just, just, why don't you just start by asking any member with a number under 30,000 to stand? All right, is there anyone here with a number under 30,000? You let the person with the lowest number adjourn the meeting. Is there anyone under 30,000? Like 40,000. Anyone under 40,000? Ah, here we go. Oh, we have two. Do you know your numbers? 30648.
Uh, is that lower or higher back here? We zero six four eight. JJ, I think it's, you know the procedure. <laughs>